Welcome and thank you for tuning in. You're listening to the Beyond 50 Radio Program. I'm Daniel Davis. Soccer, the women's American soccer team wins the World Cup. Pretty exciting stuff when that happens here in America. But the question is, is how come America doesn't win the World Cup? Is there something going on behind the scenes economically that perhaps does not allow us to prevail to have the number one trophy of the world. Joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program today is author of the book Money and Soccer. It's a soccernomics guide for those who want to find out a little bit more about what goes on behind the scenes. I'd like to welcome to the Beyond 50 radio program today our guest, Simon Cooper. Simon, thank you for joining us here on the program today. Hi, thanks for having me. Actually, I wrote Soconomics, uh, Money and Soccer is by my Soconomics co-author, Stefan Chermansky. Yeah, that's the book I have in front of me. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> so tell us how this all came together. Um, well, I met Stefan at a conference in Turkey about eight years ago. I'm a journalist. He's an economist. And we got chatting with both Brits, and we discovered we think very similarly about soccer, that if you bring data to it, then a lot of mysteries about soccer can be clarified, because there's a huge amount of there's always been a huge amount of bar talk about soccer which player is better than another which coach is better than another uh why some teams win and some don't and we decided to bring data to the whole discussion and the result was soccernomics and now Stefan has written money and soccer for which I proudly wrote the foreword now this seems to be one of those sports that really gains super prominence uh in other words uh it seems to be more and more accepted uh you know, like, say, within the United States, uh, that more and more people are actually watching it. It's getting that commercial uh, value going on there, but it seems to be also erupting in scandal, especially when it comes to the FIFA. Tell us about what's going on here. Yeah, FIFA is the international soccer authority. They run the game around the world, and the key thing they have is they run the World Cup which is uh, probably the most lucrative property in sports ahead of the Olympics. I mean, the World Cup is now watched around the world, so it brings in several billion in TV rights um, every time it's played. FIFA control that money, and your FBI began to uncover the scandals and the bribery around TV deals, chiefly, that all sorts of people in FIFA were doing, and uh, they really rocked the whole organization. This happened in May. And as a result of the FBI's investigation, uh, Sepp Blatter, the um, very dubious FIFA president, has agreed to resign. He's supposedly stepping down next February. So uh, everyone is hoping that FIFA will become slightly less scandalous and that some of these billions that come in for the World Cup will actually be spent on building soccer fields in poor countries and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Now, it's interesting because, you know, soccer is one of those uh, sports, that, especially here in the United States, that sort of catches on and then it fades. I remember back in the nineteen mid-1970s uh, when you had uh, Pele actually coming into the United States for the first time and, and then, you know, all of a sudden there was this uh, team, the New York Cosmos, fantastic team. But then again, there wasn't a whole lot that could really challenge them in the United States. And in fact, it was interesting when you would see clubs try to get up and get going, and they would end up with people who really didn't know how to play the game that were coaches. So you really had subpar teams. But this also seems to be something that happens really around the world with different countries as well. Tell us more about that. Yeah, I mean, what you're seeing is the spread of soccer in the last 20 years to new territories, uh, the U.S., Japan, uh, China, uh, the cities in India at least, have suddenly begun to switch on to soccer. And so you now get soccer on NBC in the U.S. Uh, you get um, far higher viewing figures for the Women's World Cup final than for the NBA finals or the World Series. So soccer really, uh, thanks to TV, has penetrated these new territories. And, um, you know, this is an incredible growth market for the game. Whereas, say, American gridiron football and baseball have been pretty bad at exporting themselves. I mean, the Super Bowl is a huge phenomenon in the U.S., but not outside. Soccer really, once it's on TV, it takes off. And if you put together China, the U.S., India, Indonesia, that's 45% of the world's population. Well, all these countries are getting into soccer. So the growth is phenomenal. Now, what's interesting is I understand that you had read the book Moneyball, and uh, there seems to kind of be uh, some similarities when it comes to statistics. Now, soccer is a way different game, obviously, than baseball, but, you know, you also see the insights that are possible in rising, being able to understand more of a balance of what you're going after. Does that kind of make sense? 
Yeah, I mean, when we began writing the book, I'd actually never read Moneyball. I am quite a baseball fan, but uh, that was my prompt to pick up the book and read it in one sitting, open mouth. And what a fantastic book it is. And I was actually struck by uh, the many similarities between the mistakes old-style baseball people were making and the mistakes old-style soccer people were still making because soccer is probably about 20 years behind baseball in adopting data. And so, for example, um, Billy Bean says in Moneyball, don't scout high school players, scout college players, because in you know, 17, 18 year old, you really have no idea how good he's going to be in the end. Whereas with a 22 year old, he's much better formed, you have a much better idea. Same proves to be true in soccer. Um, you buy an 18 year old, your chances of success are very low. Um, one of the key Bill James insights, Bill James, the great baseball statistician, is that players don't peak in their early 30s, as had always been thought in baseball, they peak in their late 20s. Well, exactly the same is true in soccer. Players peak in their late 20s, and uh, a lot of money is wasted on spending, buying players over 30 who uh, tend to have very sharp declines. Now, let's talk about why soccernomics is important for people uh, to, to really see soccer from this light. Um, because in baseball, you always had numbers. So there was always some sense that, that you judged players on numbers. For example, batting average. turned out that batting average, of course, wasn't the best gauge of a player, but still, there was always some kind of number brought to the issue. In, in, in soccer, there was just a huge amount of talk, of blather, and uh, there was almost no rigor, no attempt to use stats. Now, I was Hi. kind of interested about this one particular team that you talk about, uh, uh, Leon. And uh, tell us about that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just like the Oakland A's in Moneyball are the example of a small money team that does very well by doing very smart things, we found that Leon in France were doing incredibly smart things. Uh, they would buy players in their early 20s, and they were very open to trading their best players for more money. Because in soccer, if you sell a player, as we call it, to another team. The other team has to pay you for that player, different from in American sports. So they were very cunning at kind of running the market on players. They would buy a player when he was lowly valued. They would sell when he was highly valued. And, um, you know, there's a few teams in soccer that have huge amounts of money, like Real Madrid and Manchester United. But most teams are really trying to um, work with very limited budgets. And if you're going to try and do that, we said Lyon in France were just a fantastic example. Mm -hmm. I know it is, too, especially when it comes to the players such as Karim Benzema and Michael Essien. Tell us about those two. Yeah, I mean, Karim Benzema was a player they produced uh, themselves at Lyon. He's a local boy, and uh, he became a center forward, you know, the player who scores the goals or the key goal scorer. And those players are the most overvalued. Um, clubs tend to pay way too much for them. So if you want to buy a good center forward, it's incredibly expensive. So Lyon decided, well, we're not going to buy a good center forward. Um, they spent money on goalkeepers and defenders who cost much less. And finally, they produced a great centre forward in Benzema, and then they sold him to Real Madrid for loads of money, where he still is today. He's had a great career. Uh, Michael Essien, he was a young Ghanaian, and um, uh, Leon found him in Africa, bought him for very little money. No, sorry, he was already in France. He'd come to France. Leon bought him for very little money. A few years later, sold him on to Chelsea. He went on to have a great career. But Leon did financially very, very well out of him. So a kind of sequence of those kinds of deals. And we found one interesting thing they did is they used the wisdom of crowds to make their decisions. It wasn't just one uh, executive or the club president, as often happens, making the decision more or less on a whim. It was a group of six or seven people who'd sit down and discuss, do we want to sign this player? Do we want to sell this player? And wisdom of crowds is, um, is by far the smartest way to make these decisions. Mm -hmm. But it's very unusual in soccer. Now, one thing that's really fascinating about soccer, although it does occur in sports quite frequently, but it seems kind of toned down, especially in a fair amount of the U.S. professional sports, is the flamboyance that you tend to see with soccer players. I remember, you know, there was the hard-drinking soccer player and, you know, bend it like Beckham, and, and it just goes on and on and on. And, but it seems to be dealt with in a different way when it comes to soccer, doesn't it? Sorry, you mean the flamboyance is dealt with differently than... Yeah, the egos, things like that. It's sort of something they encourage on the one hand, but it's also something that, you know, managers and coaches tend to talk down on as well. Yeah, I mean, there used to be this rock star era that you had people like 
Diego Maradona and George Best, who would really live like rock stars. They would party like rock stars. They would use drugs or drink too much. And this was kind of the norm in soccer until about the 90s. Um, and, you know, players would think, well, I'm not paid so much. I have this short career, so I'm really going to max out and have fun. And then when money started to come into the game or from the 90s, the club said, okay, we're paying you loads of money now, and now you're really going to behave. So now you, you're in a phase where the top players, I mean, they barely even drink coffee because if you drink an espresso, it dehydrates you. So almost nobody in the top of the game drinks alcohol, hardly any at all. Uh, these players are incredibly clean living. They're way more sort of disciplined and athletic, I would guess, than baseball or basketball players here in the States. Sorry, not necessarily more athletic than basketball players, but a lot more clean living. So it's become a very kind of disciplined, rigorous game, which it never used to be. I mean, players used to live half their lives in nightclubs, so that's gone. <laughs> well, thank goodness. I can't see, you know, being out drinking all night and then being able to run up and down a field for the next 180 minutes, for instance. But, you know, what's really interesting, uh, too, is that there used to be a time that you've seen sort of national differences in how teams performed, and and that seems to be kind of shrinking. It's becoming more of an international style now. Kind of give us a little more detail about that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it used to be that you know the British played this very uh, physical, warrior-like soccer, and the Brazilians were all about uh, dribbling and art, and then the Dutch had these kind of geometric passing patterns. And people really liked that. It was, you know, I grew up with Dutch soccer. I grew up in Holland, and, and I, I felt a love for that. It felt like the country was expressing itself in the kind of soccer it played. And it felt like if you saw Brazil, that you were seeing kind of the Brazilian soul on the field. And there was something beautiful about that. But sadly, it's gone now, because now that it, it, the best international soccer is on TV every night, everyone copies it. So whether you're Real Madrid or Manchester United or Holland or... England or Germany or the U.S., they all play pretty much the same kind of style. It's very fast-moving. Uh, you touch the ball once. Um, players cover an enormous amount of territory. They're very disciplined about positions. And, um, yeah, it's an international style. And you might want to succeed. A lot of Brazilians, for example, would love to succeed playing the old way, slow, dribbling game. It just doesn't work. And so all these national styles are dying out. Now, here's one thing, too, um, you know, that for instance, England seems to be the country that seems to have been considered the uh, place where soccer was born, but that they seem to sort of be underachievers. How is that? Yeah, I mean, the English are always moaning about how we should be doing much better and we should be doing the world, winning the World Cup, or at least challenging to win the World Cup. And uh, they're tremendously down on their national team. You know, the way the U.S. beats up on their politicians, the English beats up on their soccer team. And what we say in Soconomics is actually this is unfair because... Why do we think England should win the World Cup? I mean, sure, we you know, codified the rules of modern soccer 150 years ago, but it's not clear to me that that buys you any advantage in 2015, what we did in 1863, um, because you know, most other serious soccer countries have well over a century of experience. So why should we be better than these other countries? And um, you know, Argentina, Germany, France, Italy, all these people, they know just as much as we do about how to play soccer. And so we say um, the English should uh, relax and let up on their team. We have 50 million people. they are a moderately wealthy country, and wealth is important because rich countries tend to do better. And, um, you know, we, I don't see why we should be world champions. So we say England perform about as well as you'd expect and perhaps even slightly better. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting when you think about the economics of all of this, too. I remember there was a video that I was catching on YouTube, and it was about billionaires and there was a particular billionaire that literally was buying a championship team. <laughs> you know, it's much like the New York Yankees here in the United States. You know, you, you throw enough money and that team should win. Does that sort of kind of fly the same way when it comes to soccer? Yeah, it does. I mean, uh, we show in Soconomics that there's an incredibly sharp correlation between wages and uh, league position. So... Um, the way it mostly works is the team with the highest wages for its players finishes top, the team with the lowest wages finishes bottom. And um, it's not a totally iron rule, but if you average it out over 10 years, the correlation is over 90%. So pretty much, yeah, the, the best players cost the most, and they will win you the matches. Now, one thing I found really interesting, too, is sometimes the perceptions that countries have when it comes to their approach of the game that really, to me, was interesting to look at. For instance, in Germany, you know, the way they take a look at it. Uh, I remember reading in the book that 
they describe both debt and guilt as being the same thing in one word, and it seems to have, you know, sort of their way that they look at things, so to speak, especially when it comes to soccer. And I found that really interesting that that was written. Um, yeah, the whole German issue of debt and guilt is very interesting. Schultz is the same word. I mean, um, Germany really rethought its football. I mean, remember, they're the current world champions, but they had a very bad phase for about 10 years or so. And having once been a great soccer country, they hit rock bottom around 2000. And then they did something very impressive, which is they said, OK, let's look at the best countries, which at the time were probably Holland, Germany, later Spain. And the Germans said, we're going to study what these guys do and we're going to copy it rigorously. And so they learned the kind of intelligent, fast-passing game from the Dutch and the French, later the Spaniards. And they taught their young players that. They gave up the kind of hard training, uh, very much a physical fitness-based old-style German game. They totally reformed their soccer, and now they're world champions playing really gorgeous attacking soccer. So kudos to the Germans. It's a very brave thing to give up your whole soccer, soccer culture, and they did. Yeah. I know what's also interesting, too, is that uh, you talk about how, for instance, in the United States, a lot of the major league sports teams, there are restrictions, salary caps, and only so much a team's allowed to be able to purchase with so much. And But in soccer, there isn't those kind of things going on there. And then, in fact, when it gets to a point where you have the lower teams who don't do so well, they pretty much just kick them out of the league. <laughs> There's no real amateur development or anything like that, which you tend to see a lot of times in U.S. sports. Uh, well, we do have amateur development in the sense that, you know, people play soccer. Um, people play soccer as kids unpaid for fun, and some of them become very good and become professionals. Uh, you know, in Western Europe, you join a club. My kids belong to clubs in Paris where we live, and it costs almost nothing, and you're coached, and the best kids from all those small clubs will become pros. So there is a kind of little league-like system all over Europe or in Costa Rica where I just was, where in every village there's a beautiful soccer field and the kids learn to play. In terms of uh, salary caps, yeah, we never had that. It's true, but we're moving that way. I mean, the, the English clubs have kind of voluntarily agreed to limit salary spending because... What they've done is they looked at the U.S. and they've seen in the U.S. you can run a sports club and actually make a profit. I mean, many U.S. sports clubs are profitable. And it's, the U.S. sports clubs are profitable partly because they have a salary cap, so they don't give all the money to their athletes. And the European soccer clubs have said, well, we want some of that. We want to not pay out every single dollar we get into our players, so we're going to try and, um, you know, through agreements, cut their salaries. And that's starting to happen, and now you're seeing that the big clubs are actually turning a profit for pretty much the first time in history because owning a soccer club always used to be a great way to lose money. <laughs> it's sort of like the billionaire uh, Warren Buffett says, if you want to become a millionaire, become a billionaire and then buy an airline. <laughs> yes. <laughs> now, uh, you we're kind of talking on this right here about what is known as financial fair play regulations. Now, is this something that's kind of coming in that's becoming new? Yeah, I mean, uh, there's a new kind of system for European soccer clubs that they aren't allowed to spend more than their revenues. And that was aimed to undermine these billionaire oligarchs you're talking about, the Russians or Qataris who buy big clubs and then put their private fortunes in to buy the best players. And now with new laws, they're not allowed to do that very freely. So if you want to spend a dollar, you have to show that you've earned that dollar through tickets or TV rights or sponsors or whatever. And that is that has curbed the spending a bit. But the Qataris and Russians and so on have argued back, and it seems they'll be given a little bit more leeway than we thought. So if you, if you are a vain, rich billionaire and you want to buy a soccer club and throw money into it, you still have an avenue to do that. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, soccer is also thought of as big business. It's a billion-dollar one, and it needs big ideas to explain it. Now, kind of talk about what that means exactly. Um, sorry, big business. Yes, big business, uh, you know, that it's certainly a billion-dollar one, as we were just, as you were just talking about, but it needs big ideas to explain it. What does that mean exactly? Well, I mean, people say soccer's a big business. We've always, Stefan and I, have, we've argued against it. Um, you know, if you take the biggest soccer clubs in the world, Manchester United, Barcelona, Real Madrid, with the highest revenues, I mean, they have higher revenues than the New York Yankees or the Dallas Cowboys but their revenues are still well below a billion dollars a year each. 
So they would not be anywhere near the S&P 500. These are not big companies by any stretch of the imagination. I mean, the World Cup takes in something close to $7 billion over four years, which means that FIFA also, the World Cup also, would not be a, uh, you know, a large quoted company in the U.S. So you know, if you add up the whole European soccer sector, all the European soccer clubs together, and you know, most of the soccer businesses in Europe, they would still have a much smaller rev- total combined revenue than a large company like Siemens. So lots of these companies, and of course lots of the clubs are loss-making. So big business, I'm not sure. Big ideas, that's what I've always thought. You need big ideas to explain soccer because, I mean, I've always said when a game is watched by billions of people, it ceases to be just a game. I mean, as you saw in the U.S. when your women's team won the World Mm -hmm. Cup, it can mobilize an entire country. It gets people talking about the strengths of your country, the weaknesses of a country. It gets uh, politicians elected. It can... um, fuel mafias. I've seen that in Ukraine. I mean, soccer has this enormous power, which isn't really reflected in money, but just this enormous power to touch people's emotions and minds. And yes, there's a lot of explaining to do about that. Soccer is this big force in the world, which is poorly understood. You know, and that's what really makes this so interesting, because unlike in the United States, where we have you know, different teams from different states, you know, and so, or cities for that matter, uh, you tend to have that sort of thing, that inspiration going on, but only within a city. It's like, okay, all of a sudden the New York Yankees are the world champions, and, and so New York gets to enjoy the limelight of saying, you know, we're the best baseball team there is in the United States. But soccer is a much broader appeal. We're talking, as you were just saying, about countries. That's a whole different ball game altogether, and it seems to be growing and spreading where more and more countries, uh, you can see in the future, might potentially even stand up and be accepting the championship trophy. Tell us about what you see in the future and what companies might be rising to that challenge. Um, I mean, the U.S., I think, is a long-term contender to win the Men's World Cup as well, just because you have so many people playing soccer. uh, More and more your best players go early to Europe, where the best soccer is played. So uh, we see the U.S. and Japan as serious long-term contenders. Um, we're very, we don't think Iraq's going to win the World Cup in anyone's lifetime, but Iraq has done incredibly well given the, all the country's problems and chaos. It's been a great soccer country, so we see that one is rising if, if Iraq ever becomes halfway normal. I mean, uh, right now, Europe, Western Europe really dominates. I mean, we Western Europeans have won the last three World Cups, um, Italy, Spain, and Germany, and never before has a continent won three in a row. Um, We've won two of those outside Europe, in Africa and in Latin America. So Europeans are really dominant. And, um, you know, Western Europe's only 6% of the world's population, but it has pretty much all the best soccer. And the other 94 have one team, Argentina, which can match the best Europeans. So do you see, uh, based on what's been written here, that in time things will be really tightening up so that there is balance? Because it seems that... You know, as you were saying, uh, a lot of times Americans will go to Europe where some of the better or the best soccer is played so they can develop there. Then they come back and then they bring that talent, that skill to the U.S. soccer team. But do you see where there might be a balance where it almost seems equal, as we were talking about earlier, more of an international style where, you know, if there's a tournament that goes on for about 10 days, in the end it's probably the people who are in the best shape that are probably going to win? I mean, I think the U.S. uh, league is very far behind just financially because um, I think there's about 20 leagues in the world that pay players more than the U.S. uh, Major League Soccer does. So pretty much any good soccer player, almost any, is going to want to go, if he's in the U.S., he's going to want to go to Europe. That, That is where by far the highest wages are paid, except for a couple of anomalies like Qatar or Saudi Arabia where you can earn good money playing bad soccer. And, um, you know, if the U.S. teams want to change that, they're going to have to let the club spend more and therefore make losses. I mean, you do have this window for the odd star player, like um, you've you've brought in very highly paid, a few very highly paid star players from Europe, like Andrea Pirlo in New York or Steven Gerrard in Los Angeles, and these guys are allowed to earn a lot of money. But the whole rest of the team, often you have people, you know, earning very, very modest salaries, and uh, so most of those guys are going to want to go elsewhere. Uh, it's all pretty amazing stuff. I know when I was uh, uh, looking into the FIFA situation and, you know, 
I was thinking, you know, they're not any different than, for instance, the NFL is here in America. Uh, what you tend to see here is, look, we'd like to buy this, you know, new stadium, have this new stadium put up for the city. And But what we want is we want all the taxpayers basically to pay for this thing to happen. And once it's up, then we get to collect all the revenues, ticket sales, parking, you name it, uh, from this, and none of it goes back to the city. And you kind of think, well, FIFA is kind of pretty much doing the same thing. Yeah, we say that in Soconomics. It's a very similar kind of ripple system that, you know, American City builds a subsidized stadium for for some billionaire owner of a sports team. The billionaire now only gets all the proceeds and the city's taxpayers pay all the money. I mean, I'm sitting here talking to you from Miami where that is exactly happening. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it happens quite a bit. Then they threaten the city, well, we're going to pull the team. And I'm just, you know, I actually had a guest on the program about banning football. You know, he loves football, grew up broadcasting football and so forth. And we came to agree it's just like soccer. It's beautiful to watch it played. But when you look at the fringes about the money that's involved and these billionaires that are kind of sticking their hands in there and, and trying to find ways to take full advantage of how they can make, for instance, a city or, in the case of soccer, a whole country, divvy out maybe money they just don't have, and then the next thing you know, the billionaire gets to collect all the revenues. None of it goes back into the city. You know, Detroit's one of those examples. <laughs> you know, and, it just, and it's just fascinating, especially like with FIFA. I know they were very much doing the same thing, for instance, down in South America, you know, building this enormous stadium with money that the place didn't have out in the middle of nowhere that was basically going to host, you know, one World Cup game maybe, and that would be the end of it. And then what do you do with the stadium? Just kind of let it rot? Um, yeah, I mean, that's what happened in South Africa, which is not a rich country, which uh, built 12 stadiums, I think it was, for the World Cup in 2010. Wow. And, um, you know, I would say that Ten out of those stadiums are completely useless. Uh, grass growing between the seats costs a lot of money to maintain them. One in Cape Town overlooking the ocean, completely useless to the city. Enormous waste of money in a city where many people are homeless. It's sad and disgraceful. And Brazil, exactly the same thing. They just built 12 stadiums. One is being used as pretty much a bus depot. <laughs> Pretty fascinating stuff. Is this? Uh, do you see that people should be taking a look at this and have a little more concern about this, or do you see that there's really a problem in the future when it comes to soccer and economics? I mean, we're seeing around the world that smarter cities, smarter countries are saying, we don't want to bid for these events. I mean, Boston deciding not to bid for the Olympics, that's part of a general trend in the Olympics. To some degree in American sport where there's a bit more reluctance, or certainly was during the long long American crisis, the economic crisis, reluctance by cities to pay for these stadiums. So, uh, yeah, I think there is a wising up that's happening. I mean, in soccer, they've given, you know, World Cups. The next two are going to non-democracies, I would say, Russia and Qatar, where the leaders of those countries don't really care about what the country's money is spent on because it's not supposed to be spent on the citizens anyway. So, uh, you know, if you're Qatar and you want to build 10 stadiums in a very small place for a World Cup that's going to last a month, you can just go ahead and do it because, uh, <laughs> you know, this is a monarchy. Oh, it's all crazy stuff, isn't it? Do you sometimes, as you're looking into this, find your blood kind of boiling a little bit? Like, when are people, I mean, even though these are beautiful sporting events to watch, can you wake up and start taking control? Like, okay, you want to pull the team? Go ahead and pull it. And that city's not going to want them either. What's a billionaire to do? <laughs> yeah, luckily in soccer we don't have this problem so much of um, cities teams threatening right. to move city because soccer teams never move city. So um, they don't say, oh, we'll leave, leave your city unless you build us a free stadium. So that whole blackmailing issue we don't have. The World Cup, yes, it does make you a blood boil. <laughs> I can believe it would. Simon, I want to thank you, first of all, for uh, taking the time to join us here on the program about this fascinating subject. Is there a website people can find out more about this? Yeah, we have a website, soconomics-agency.com, soconomics-agency.com. Simon, thank you so much for joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program. Thank you. We want to thank you, the listeners out there, for tuning in. You can also discover more by visiting us at beyond50radio.com. That is the number 50, and also sign up for our free weekly e-news updates. We can also be followed on Twitter at Beyond 50 Radio. I'm Daniel Davis. Thank you for tuning in. This is the Beyond 50 Radio program, and remember, live your day past.